Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, Dr. Tara Murphy from the University of Sydney joins us, looking at an odd radio burst seen coming from roughly the direction of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. We're also going to take a look at a possible discovery of a planet in the Whirlpool galaxy, the first ever found possibly outside the Milky Way. And we're going to examine a massive solar flare that produced a cloud of plasma which barely missed Earth over the weekend. Finally, we're going to head out to Jupiter where NASA's Juno spacecraft made some intriguing new findings before welcoming our special guest. Now, could M51 ULS 1B B? To be or not to be? The first planet ever found in another galaxy? Now, planets cannot normally be seen in other galaxies, not even individual stars for the most part, due to the enormous gulf of space. However, a team of researchers at the Center for Astrophysics recently searched an X-ray binary system. These pair a sun-like star with an ultra-dense partner like a neutron star or black hole. These conditions allowed astronomers to see X-rays from near the ultra-dense partner blink out for about three hours before returning. Astronomers suggest this could be explained by a Saturn-like planet in that system blocking the star as it past in its orbit, or but a second pass which might help confirm the existence of such an exoplanet is not due for another 70 years. We'll uh, make sure to report on that in 2091. On 23rd November, we're going to talk with Dr. Rosan De Stefano about this intriguing finding. Make sure to join us then. Now, on Thursday, the 28th of October, a powerful X1 solar flare erupted from the sun, releasing a cloud of magnetically charged plasma headed toward Earth, which passed our world just in time for Halloween. Boom! These events have the potential of affecting satellites high above Earth, and they can occasionally produce dazzling displays of northern and southern lights. Such X-class flares are the most powerful such events the sun can produce. However, this X-1 flare was just about 10% as powerful as the massive X-10 flares, which occasionally erupt across the stellar surface, and the cloud of particles produced nearly missed our planet. This time. Heading out to Jupiter, NASA's Juno spacecraft revealed new details of that world's atmosphere in stunning 3D observations. Using a microwave radiometer aboard Juno, Astronomers were able to glimpse beneath the Jovian clouds, finding the banded colors we see near, near the um, surface of the clouds extend beneath these cloud tops. However, deep beneath the familiar surface of Jupiter, circulation and meteorology grow radically different. The dark reddish belts, which are rich in microwave radiation at the outer layers of the Jovian atmosphere, fade out in these microwave wavelengths. Meanwhile, the whitish zones, typically microwave poor at the outer boundaries of that world, start to glow brightly in these frequencies at these depths. This situation suggests little understood 
tacticians are responsible for this fascinating finding. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we're going to talk with Dr. Tara Murphy of the University of Sydney about her work discovering odd radio signals coming from the direction of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Professor Tara Murphy. She is from the School of Physics at the University of Sydney, and she's here to talk to us about a fascinating discovery from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Welcome to the show, Tara. Hi, it's good to be here. Good. So, um, what do we know so far about this object with the catchy name of ASCAP J173608.2-32635? <laughs> I'm going to yes. call it Henrietta from now on. <laughs> Sorry, uh, astronomers do tend to name our objects just after the position that they appear in the sky, so it's a very boring name. Uh, what we know so far is that we were pointing our telescope, ASCAP, towards the centre of the galaxy, so that galactic centre region, and we were monitoring the sky. And then this object, after many months of monitoring, suddenly appeared. The two most interesting things about this object are that it changes in brightness by up to 100 times. So you can imagine this thing goes from being extremely faint or even invisible to extremely bright. And the second thing that's really interesting is the radio emission, the light from this object, is circularly polarized, which is a very rare property in an astronomy object. Hmm. And what attracted you? I mean, there's a lot of sky up there. What, what attracted you to look at this, this particular patch of sky? So I'm running a project called the ASCAP Variables and Slow Transient Survey, and our mission is to look for astronomical objects that change on very rapid timescales. The reason that's interesting is because when something is changing on rapid timescales, it means there's some really extreme physics going on in that object. Now, we know from the past uh, from past surveys that quite a lot of those things happen towards the center of our galaxy. There's a lot of stars towards the center of our galaxy. So it's a really good place to look for rare things because there's just so many things there. Hmm. And what is it that makes makes um, this net? You know, we have 36 radio telescopes uh, that are taking part in the ASCAP survey. Um, what, what makes those instruments in that array so special? From the point of view of detecting transient sources, so things that appear and disappear, you can imagine that it's very hard to catch them because they're only visible for short periods of time. And so the cool thing about ASCAP is that it has an enormous field of view. So it can see 30 square degrees of the sky at any given time. Now, if you think about the moon, when you look at the sky, that's only half a degree uh, across. So um, you're talking about an enormous region of sky. It can see thousands and thousands of objects at the same time. And so that makes it really good for looking at rare things because you're essentially able to look at an enormous number of things and maybe find the unusual ones. Mm -hmm. And so, what do we mean? The, from what I was reading, and as I understand, the center of this signal was about four degrees off from the center of the galaxy, which, in your know, perspective, is about eight full moons. Mm -hmm. So, do we think that this is? Do you think that this is directly related to? Anything related at the center, like say the supermassive black hole, or or do you think this is entirely independent of its position? 
That's a good question. So it's most probably not associated with the supermassive black hole at the center because we would expect that to be really closely aligned on the sky if it was. But within four degrees, you're still talking about a region of our galaxy where there is a very high density of stars. Now, the reason that we then would see more of these things there is because when those stars are born, when those stars die, when those stars undergo um, extreme processes in their life, that's when they can emit this really strong radio emission. And so the fact that there's lots of stars there in that direction uh, is probably why we detect these signals from, to from near the center of the galaxy. Hmm. And so what do we know about the neighborhood that this thing this thing was found in. What, what sort of objects are there? What, what, what could that tell us about it? So the region towards the center of the galaxy, it has a large number of stars. Now that means that it has a large number of young stars. It also means it has a large number of old stars. And some of those stars, when they die, they form things like neutron stars. Neutron stars are the very rapidly spinning dead remnants of a star. And they emit these really rapid pulses. And that's one of the hypotheses we had for what this object could be, is that it was some kind of neutron star. Now, the other property of towards the center of the galaxy, there's also a lot of dust. So it can be very hard to see things with visible light. So if you imagine visible light traveling through our galaxy, it's attenuated. So it's sort of stopped by dust. It's absorbed by dust. And so it can be very hard to see things in visible light. But the cool thing about radio waves, they're much longer. So visible light, uh, you think about that, it's uh, hundreds of nanometers in wavelength, but radio waves are centimeters to meters, and they can just travel straight through that dust, almost unaffected by it. And so one of the cool things about ASCAP is when we look towards the center of our galaxy, we can actually see things that we can't see in visible light. Hmm. And speaking of which, and you folks did try to look up to see, you know, after you saw this radio signal, you did look to see if there was anything there visible in visible light, and there didn't seem to be. That How do you explain that? Yeah, that's right. So one of our, uh, sorry, one of our hypotheses was that this was a flaring star. So I mentioned at the beginning the circular polarization. That's a very strange property of, of light. That means that um, the light is not only aligned in a single plane, but that plane is rotating as it's traveling towards us. And the two types of objects that uh, cause that the most are pulsars and stars when they are flaring. So we thought this could be a stellar flare. But when we search for it in visible light, we see nothing. For a star to be that bright, to be flaring that brightly, but yet not visible in optical visible light, it means that um, it pretty much rules out that a hypothesis or it's a very, very, very cool dim star and we need uh, better observations to try and find it. That's, that's awesome. And so um, what other observations um, might be undertaken, uh, for instance, with web, you know, an infrared light, or, you know, are you able to, what other instruments are you hoping to be able to, what other eyes are you looking forward to setting on this thing? Yeah, so the interesting thing is from what we've done so far, we've already looked with many radio telescopes, including some of the best in the world. Uh, we've looked in optical light, we've looked in x-rays, um, and we've ruled out, in fact, almost every hypothesis that we had. So the key to trying to make more progress on what this is, uh, is firstly trying to get simultaneous observations with different telescopes at the same time. And that's actually really hard because we don't know when this telescope, when this object will actually switch back on again. So we are going to have to monitor it with one telescope and then when it switches on, trigger the others um, to start observing it at the same time. The other thing we're going to try and do is use what's called VLBI, so very long baseline interferometry, where we use different radio telescopes that are separated by kilometers around the world, and we combine their information together to get a really high precision measurement of the position um, so that we can tell whether this object is moving and maybe um, actually get a distance to it. So we do have some things planned, but the challenge with these rare objects is that because they're not switched on all the time, it's kind of difficult to plan your next experiment. Yeah, but it is. 
Um, and so, you know, we, you know, we've talked a little bit about what, what this thing is not, you know, but do you have any idea? Here comes the big question. Yeah. What, what is it? What, what could it be? What's your gut feeling or your thoughts on that? So I have an answer, but it's a very unsatisfying one. Yeah, um, those are the yeah. best in science. They really are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so over the last couple of decades, there have been a very small number of objects found that share similar but not identical properties. And in the scientific literature, these have been called galactic center radio transients. They're not all right at the center, but they are all within the kind of region of the center of the galaxy, like... I discussed at the beginning of the interview. The thing is, none of them are the same as each other. So, and, and as you can tell, the name Galactic Center Radio Transients is simply a descriptive name. It's not a name that suggests we know what they are. It's a, a name, a sort of a bucket to put these unknown objects in and say, our object is most similar to one of these Galactic Center Radio Transients, but it's not the same as any of them, and none of them are the same as each other, which means that maybe we have discovered a new type of object. Maybe this is some kind of strange neutron star that's in the process of dying, um, and spitting out radio emissions sporadically. We're not really sure what these GCRTs are, but we're hoping that now that we have these new telescopes, ASCAP and Meerkat and so on, that we will start finding enough of them that we can work out what they are. Hmm. That's absolutely fascinating. So what do we know so far about the GCRTs other than their general location and they might all have some qualities like each other? Yeah, so if I could get a little bit technical, the, the properties that they broadly have in common are they're located towards uh, the center of the galaxy um, in a broad sense. They are um, high, often highly polarized. So that means that uh, this light is not just um, uh, aligned in all directions as it's coming towards us. Um, it's got some special properties that means it's uh, generated by a particular physical process. They are highly variable, uh, but that variability is not periodic. So in other words, they, um, they change in brightness very rapidly. But for example, they can be on for weeks or only minutes and then off for months or only days. So they're unpredictable. And they also um, have often what is called a steep spectrum, which means that they're brighter at low frequencies than at high frequencies. So they are the four or five properties from a you know astrophysics point of view that they broadly have in common, but they don't share all that they don't all share all of them. That's so fascinating. And so finally, what's next for you? Will you be doing more follow-up studies of this object or are you going on to other pastures? We'll be, we'll be doing both. So we'll definitely be following up this object more within the you know, limitations of what I described, that it's very hard to catch it because it spends most of its time switched off. But this is just the first, in terms of the future plans, this is just the first discovery in our variables and slow transients project. Um, ASCAP has just been, the, the, our telescope, which is actually the telescope in the, in the background behind me, um, that telescope has just been through its pilot survey phase in the last two years, which is where we've detected this object. But next year, it starts its full survey mode and rather than just doing a hundred hours of observation we'll be doing thousands and thousands of hours of observations so i feel like this is just the first step in what's to come i say look out for more news in this space uh, next year that's great thanks so much for being on the show tara it was, it was wonderful talking with you thank you it was fun to chat yeah and that was professor tara murphy from the university of sydney Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly into your homes with fun, informative interviews. Next week, we're going to have an asteroid roundup, looking at the five major missions to asteroids happening now, furthering science and protecting Earth. Here's a preview of an interview we have with Essen Ergon Elp of Argonne National Laboratory. 
He's one of the few people in the world studying the first ever samples from the asteroid Ryugu. And he's got a big x-ray gun. The, the, the nice feature of the beamline is that it is very unique in terms of looking at iron and iron minerals. We have a very unique way of looking at the combination of the iron nucleus and the iron electrons and their interaction from which we garner a lot of information about what kind of minerals they were, what kind of conditions under which they have formed, and how much of each mineral phase exists. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of this show one day early. Together with advanced viewings of our comics, jokes, and really just a whole lot more. How do we do this, you ask? We answer. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, made a video now, or your favorite podcast provider. Remember, you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Mm-hmm.